I want you to think on this thought today, um, just uh, the thought I've had as I've studied this text and uh, prayed over it uh, was the thought of four crazy friends, four crazy friends. Now, if I had to uh, preach this in a seminary class for some reason, uh, then I would probably name it Radical Faith, Radical Faith. But it's a story we find in God's Word about four uh, crazy friends. Uh, so if you will, let's look in the text this morning in Mark chapter 2, uh, beginning over in verse 1. Mark 2 uh, in verse 1. And the Bible says this, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come near unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there was certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit uh, that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee? Or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk. But ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of palsy. I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thy house. And immediately he arose and took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. You may be seated, and may God add the blessings to the reading of his word. Uh, today, we find that just a very, very interesting story here. To me, uh, it's one of the most uh, powerful stories that we can find uh, in the Word of God. Uh, and just as a synopsis, really quick to keep you focused. So we see this story about Jesus is in town and he's preaching. Uh, and as he's preaching, the church is full, or the house, I should say, because they were in a house. And many people, many commentators think it was Peter's house. Uh, but uh, the house was packed. I mean packed out. In fact, if you study Matthew, watch this. Matthew says this. Matthew even makes the point to say uh, that the power of God was present to heal them all. That the power of God was present to heal them all. Do you think that would make a difference in our church attendance today if people really understood and realized this morning uh, that the power of God is present to heal them all? Don't you think people would find a way and find a reason to come to God's house if they knew that whatever was ailing them, whatever was troubling them, whatever was causing them pain and heartache, uh, that the Lord was here and his power was here present to heal them all? Boy, we had packed the house out, wouldn't we? And this house where Jesus was teaching, it was packed. And the, but what's interesting to note is this, and I want you to stay with me because this ties right into the end. What's interesting to note is, is that even though the power of God was present to heal them all, not all of them received healing. Isn't that really interesting? See, Sometimes I think the way the Lord works, and it's obvious from this text, Jesus didn't show up with his power to heal them all and, and go row by row. He didn't say, you're healed, 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 you're healed. You're healed. He didn't go around the room and do that. He could have done that, but he didn't do that. So I believe what it takes is what exactly what, uh, what the Bible teaches us is that uh, our Father is looking for worshipers. He's looking for those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. And for you to worship him in spirit and truth, to have that truth, you've got to have faith. And I believe you even have to have radical faith. Uh, but you kind of get what you come looking for. And so if you come expecting nothing, then you'll hit that target every time. Uh, but if you got up and you come today expecting something from the Lord because his power is present to heal you all, 
then you'll leave here with more than you come today. He's more than willing to load your wagon this morning. Do you understand that? Say amen. Amen. Good. We've got five farmers in here. Understand what a wagon is. So this is an interesting story. Jesus is present. He's teaching. The power of God's present there to heal them all. The place is so packed that nobody else could get in. And so these four men, they, they get together with a burden because they've got another friend who's sick and he's on a stretcher and he's paralyzed. And they put together this plan and they take their friend to Jesus and they're, or they're trying to take him to Jesus. They come to the door of the house and they can't even get in. There's no more room. The bouncer at the door says, can't let you in, man. We're already at maximum capacity. You're going to have to go somewhere else. Well, that's not good enough. And so what they do is, the Bible says, they go up to the rooftop, which is common in, in the, even today's Palestine. Uh, there's outside steps that lead up to a courtyard on the roof. So they go up to the roof. They break up the roof. They tear a hole in the roof. They lower the man down. Uh, and Jesus forgives the man's sins and then heals the man. And the man rises up and walks. And everybody was there, says, we've never seen it like that before. Can you imagine if the praise band's up here singing or the preacher's here preaching? And all of a sudden, some sheetrock starts to fall off the ceiling. And all of a sudden, somebody's busting a hole through the roof right here. And then all of a sudden, somebody's lowered down on a stretcher from, from on the roof all the way down here to the altar. And they're laid on the altar. What a shock and surprise that would be. And then to see Jesus heal that individual and to see that individual saved, forgiven, their name written in the Lamb's book of life, and then they rise up and walk from the sickness that they're in. Man, what a story the Bible has told us here. I want to tell you something. You all just go home and throw away all of your harlequin romances. You shouldn't be reading those things anyway, and I don't even know if half this crowd knows what that is. I just remember it from when I was little, seeing it on TV. But you ought to throw that junk away and read the Bible because it's got some good stuff in it. And this is one of those stories. Four crazy friends. I want you to look at a few things, if you will. Number one, as we kind of walk our way through this story, I want you to notice I see that there's really more than one door in this passage of Scripture. That They come to the first door, which is the door of disappointment. It's a door of disappointment. And, and so these guys get together and they're like, listen, man, we got to have a plan. Uh, because our buddy here, he's been sick, he's been down, uh, he is paralyzed, and there's no hope for him in doctors, there's no hope for him in medicines, there's been no hope for him in money given uh, to you know, the priest of the day. We've got to find somebody that can help him. And so they say, let's go take our friends to Jesus because when nothing else will work, when nothing else can do it, if we get them to Jesus, Jesus can do it all. And so they get their friend. They march him right to that house. They knock on that door, but they're turned away. Just where they thought they would find hope just where they thought they would find answers, just where they thought they would find deliverance, just where they thought they could go and get help from Jesus, they're turned away, and it's a door of disappointment. Boy, I, I want to tell you something. Nearly every day, thank God not every day, but nearly every day, I hear somebody calls or texts, uh, or I hear somebody mention in prayer, Someone else who has found themselves at the door of disappointment because life's not turned out the way they thought it would, because life's not turned out the way they thought it should, uh, because uh, the, a phone call came and it changed their life forever, uh, because a doctor set you down and shared something with you that you didn't think it would be or think it should be. Uh, so disappointment comes to all of us. Uh, or we look back on our life and we see that uh, maybe where we've had to walk as a child or as a young person uh, was not exactly the way we thought life would go when we were young and we had all these dreams and we, we had all of these uh, ideals about the way life was going to be. You know, we, uh, when, we're at that, when we're in high school or in college, we've got this plan. And our plan is we're going to graduate college. Our plan is, and then we're going to get married, and we're going to, we're going to build a nice little house and a white picket fence, and we're going to have a dog. 
And, and that dog's going to be named Chaco because I've always wanted a dog named Chaco. So the dog's name's Chaco. Uh, and, and, and he's going to go out, and he's going to get the paper every morning, and he'll bring the paper to, my, to my, the side of my recliner, and life's going to be so perfect, and I'm going to have kids, and those kids are going to be perfect, and they're going to have their act together. So we have all these plans, only to find out that sometimes along life's way, well, our plans fall apart. In fact, somebody once said, if you ever want to make God laugh, just let God know you got some plans. Because, see, God's got different plans in store for you and in store for me. And sometimes along life's way, we come to that door of disappointment. And so these friends, they, they come there. Now, I want to tell you something about these friends that I like about these guys. These friends, when the guy at the door said, I can't let you in, they have no more room. You're going to have to go somewhere else. Now, let me explain something here. This is where these four friends, had they been the kind of friends that, well, they lifted their pinky when they drunk their tea, or they drove a Prius. If you drive a Prius, I did not even know that. I am so sorry. I've not looked in the parking lot. When I come across, there's only trucks out there, okay? So that's nothing against you. These were not friends like that. These were friends who wouldn't take no for an answer. See, if they were most of our friends today or most of the people in our churches today, they would subscribe to the most popular theology of the day. And it's a poisonous theology. Let me tell you that. And here is that theology today. The theology today is, is if there's a door shut in our face, then we simply reside to saying, well, it must have been God's will. If we get a phone call, it's not exactly what we thought it should be, then we'll just say, well, that was God's will. Uh, If we're trying to follow God and we're trying to walk through doors and we're trying to live in light of his blessings, every time the devil throws up a roadblock or a stumbling block, we just say, well, that was God's will. There'll be something else. Well, I want to tell you something, but Jesus made it clear in his teachings about prayer that sometimes when we pray about things, then we have to pray and we have to pray again and we have to pray again. And sometimes when we ask for things, we have to ask and we have to ask again. That sometimes when we seek things, we have to seek and we have to seek and we have to seek again. You know what that means? That means the first time a door may be shut in our face. That means the first time it may not go the way we had prayed for it to go. And that's why Jesus said, hey, you got to keep praying. you got to keep asking. you got to keep seeking because if you ask, seek, and knock long enough, sooner or later I'm going to open that door. I'm going to give, I'm going to let you receive rather than just, well, it was God's will. I remember my second pastor, we were wanting, we were kind of landlocked, to be honest with you, just a a little piece of property kind of up off the side of the road. We were landlocked uh, and so forth. We were growing. We needed more uh, space in, in many different ways. And so we, 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 we knew the lady that owned the land joining us. She owned about ten and a half acres of land joining us and we decided that hey this is what we want we need her to give us this one little space of land right here maybe a half acre at most if she just give us a half acre sell it to us we'll buy it uh, then we could build an educational building and a fellowship hall right there on that little one acre of land right next to the church so we went and asked her will you sell us one acre of land she said no no I won't she's up in her 80s She has no children, nobody to pass this property on to. He said, will you you sell us this property? And she said, no, we won't. And so we just took a no for an answer. And so a little while later, that burden's still nagging, that burden's still on our heart, like we need this little one acre. And we go back and we say, listen, uh, will you sell us this little one acre? Please, we need this for our church to grow. No, I'm not interested in selling it. And so we... Walked away, said, well, that's just not the way the Lord's going to work it out. And, and so time went on, and we prayed, and we still had this burden in our heart. And I said, you know what, we need to go ask her again. But no, she said no the first two times. I know, but she's 85, 86 now. We've got to ask her again because when she dies, I think it'll all be over with. We'll never get it. So let's ask her again. And so we went and asked her again, and we went and asked her this time. She says, I'll sell it to you. 
but I'm only going to sell it to you if you'll buy all ten and a half acres that I have. And not only will I sell it to you and sell you ten and a half acres, but I'm going to sell it to you for less than half the asking price for what property right here on 441 goes for. And so see, sometimes when we come to that door of disappointment, rather than subscribe to the theology of the day and say, well, it must have been God's will. I believe these four friends were, well, these four friends were probably just tough redneck friends who would not take no for an answer. Are you with me? Did the word redneck offend anybody in here? (laughs) All right. So, so here's these four friends. So there's Bubba, there's Willie, there's Rufus, and there's Cooter. Simply because I have an Uncle Cooter in honor of him. And so these guys, they got back together. And they said, man, what, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? The dude at the door wouldn't let us in. They told us, no, I thought we were going to get Jethro healed. But they wouldn't let us in. What's the plan, guys? See, no wasn't good enough. In fact, I believe no at the door of disappointment made them more resolved to find a way. And I want you to understand something. When I was lost, the word no simply made me more resolved. And I'm glad that when God saved me, he didn't change my personality. He changed who I was on the inside and on the outside in many ways. But he let me keep enough faith to to be able to not take no for an answer when I know God's got something better in store. And so, see, that's another lesson we need to learn at the door of disappointment is this, is that oftentimes God closes a door or lets us come to a door of disappointment because he's got something better in store. And so you need to write that down. If you have found yourself at a place of disappointment in life, or if you've ever stood at the door of disappointment, then you can look back and testify that God brought you to a door of disappointment and where there was a resounding no given to you only because God had something better in store for you. And he's got it. So what did these guys do? One of them said, hey, man, I noticed when we come to the front door, He's a set of steps going up the side door. And I think if we get up there quick enough, think nobody's going to see us. And we can get up there and we can make a plan to get in this place. And so, guys, let's, do, let's get him. And they're, they're whispering because they don't want Jethro to know that, you know, that things didn't go as good as they thought it would at the door. And they don't want him to lose hope. He's already hopeless. And so they said, let's get him up top. Let's go higher, if you will. And so that's exactly what they did. They got him. They went up those steps. They got him higher. There's a little lesson there, and I don't have time to preach it right now, but let me just leave you with this and say it this way. That sometimes when we try to go in the front door and knock on the door and find it as a door of disappointment, the reason it was a door of disappointment and it was a no, you can't come in, is because God wants us to go up higher to try to come in. He wants us to seek him first in the kingdom of heaven. He wants us to get our eyes on him. He wants us to start looking up. Even though the door has been a door of disappointment, he wants us to look up and look to him so he can provide something better for us. Are you with me? Amen. And so they go up. These four friends, they get up there, they start tearing off the roof, and they tear that roof off, as the Bible teaches us, and and then they lower their friend down into the mist. He's crippled, he's on a bed, and so Jesus is preaching the word, the Bible says. Man, isn't that something, the word, preaching the word? How much better could that be? I'd like to hear that sermon and let you try to critique it and see where you didn't like what the preacher said that day. I promise you it was perfect. The word preaching the word. And so they lower the man down. And the Bible says this. The Bible says, hey, man, listen, you're, uh, I just want you to know your sins have been forgiven. Now, but, but notice, well, let's go back. The Bible says when Jesus saw the faith of that man's friends, then Jesus looked at him and said, hey, your sins are forgiven. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't Bubba, Willie, Tommy, and Cooter, 
or who did I say? Rufus and Cooter. Didn't they bring their friend to Jesus to get healing in his body? That's, I think that was the whole point of this, this operation for crazy friends. They brought the man to get healing in his body. They lowered the man down. and The Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, that he looks at the man and says, your sins are forgiven. But, but they came for the physical healing. Uh, and, and so probably, probably Willie in this circumstance looked at the other three and said, man, that's a good thing. But didn't we bring him here to get something for his body? Like, I'm glad Jesus forgive him, but we went through all of that just so he could be healed of his paralysis so he could walk again. And this is where you and I need to know this. You need to learn to thank God for when he gives you not what you want, but what you need. See, this man needed more than physical healing, spiritual healing. He needed that most importantly. And Jesus knew that. And see, we see a wonderful truth here in this passage of Scripture about not only the heart of Jesus, our Savior, but we also see his power and his, and his all-knowing ability. Because, see, the Bible tells us that story there about the scribes and the Pharisees of the day. They're, they're watching. They're critics of Jesus. They're highly critical. Everything he does, everything he says. And they're sitting there. Now watch. They never said a word. But they're sitting there watching Jesus, and the Bible makes it plain and clear twice in this text that inside of their hearts, they're sitting there thinking, only thinking, this is blasphemy. Nobody can forgive sins but God. They're only thinking that. They don't say anything. They don't act on it. They're only thinking it. And Jesus speaks out and responds to their thoughts. That's a pretty powerful truth right there, isn't it? Wouldn't that be something if I walked up to you this morning and answered you according to your thoughts, what you're thinking? Wouldn't that be something if I walked up and said, uh, well, listen, uh, this was the first thing I grabbed out of the closet. It was on sale when I bought it, and uh, I'm sorry you really don't like the color of my coat this morning. And that's what you were thinking. You were thinking, that's a hideous coat. Why did he wear that? It looks like he just reached in his closet and pulled it out and put it on. Well, that's what I did. But it was easy to do. That would be a shocker if I knew your thoughts or if you knew my thoughts. But Jesus knew their thoughts. And so he also knew this, that what this man needed was he needed salvation. He needed to be forgiven of his sins. That was the most pressing need in his life. Not what the man wanted at a time, but it's what the man needed at the time. One day you'll walk long enough in your Christian journey to be able to look back and thank God that there was times he didn't give you what you wanted, but he gave you what you needed in life because he knows what's best for you. And so, and by the way, this morning, you may have come with many, many needs. You may have come disappointed in many, many ways. But I want you to know what the Lord says and what the Lord knows is this, that the greatest need in your life is to know him in a personal relationship to be forgiven of your sins and put your faith in a God who loves you so much that he died and rose again to save your soul. And then, then though, that's not all he does. Then the Bible says that he, he turns and he looks at the man sick of palsy, of paralysis, and he tells him, now rise up and walk. Jesus dealt with the spiritual need, the greatest need, I should say, and then Jesus met this man's physical needs. Uh, and, but it's so interesting in this text. Now, as we come back, we think about four crazy friends, and we think about radical faith. Notice, and as we've preached this over and over, Brent, I think you've preached this text before. As we've preached this many, many times, <clears throat> notice the Bible does not say, <clears throat> when Jesus saw the faith of that man, Jesus healed that man. The Bible does not say that. 
The Bible says that when Jesus saw the faith of those four friends, that radical faith where they would not take no for an answer. Why would they not take no for an answer? Because they knew God's will for that man. They knew it was God's will that that man be saved. They knew it was God's will for that man to be healed. He's, he is a God who heals. If he's a God who heals, then why would God let that man lay in paralysis? And why would God say no to these men full of faith? But God saw the faith. The Lord saw the faith of those four friends. And because four friends had faith, it forever changed the life of that paralytic man. He never again laid on a stretcher and had to be a beggar all day long to make ends meet, to survive. When God saw, when the Lord saw, when the Lord Jesus saw the faith of four friends, they had radical faith. They didn't take no at the door. They went up higher. They tore the roof apart. They had to do something different, something that hadn't been done before. And when Christ saw their faith, so let me, let me say this. Girls, you can come or Abigail, whoever. <clears throat> Somewhere along the way <clears throat> in our church history, let me say it like that. And really, it's probably the failure in the pulpit, probably. Somewhere along the way, I believe that we have dumbed down the power of faith and believing. Listen to me. If we have a God in the Bible you hold in your hands who worked miracles, then I need you to know if he did miracles then and there in that book you hold in your hand, then he's still a God of miracles today. You say, how do you know that? Because that book you hold in your hand says... That he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And so if he did miracles in the lives of others in that book you hold in your hand, he does miracles today. And when I go to sleep today and wake up tomorrow, I can lay down with faith tonight knowing that the God who heals today will be the same God who heals tomorrow and for every day thereafter. So, so somewhere along the way, we've dumbed down the power of faith. And, and Jesus literally said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Listen, on that 10 and a half acres of property that we bought for less than half the market value at the time, there was a mountain, a small mountain that went up. We're just not really a mountain mountain. I mean, according to, you know, flatlanders, sand lappers, it might be a mountain, but it went up, I don't know, 80 or 90 feet. It's a great big peak right where the work needed to take place. And God, through a means of provision, allowed us to take all of that dirt, 144,000 cubic yards, weeks upon weeks of heavy equipment, taking that mountain down. We took that mountain all the way down, and it opened up about two and a half or three acres of property where we could go in there and we could build the dumbing down of faith, I believe, has been the downfall of the church today. But what Jesus still wants today, he wants some believers who's got radical faith, radical faith powerful enough to believe God on behalf of others. So there's Matthew 18, 19. And I've mentioned this many, many times, the power of what I call to pray. The power of to pray. Where the Lord says... If two or more of you agree about a certain thing, you, you agree on that matter, then I'll do it in heaven. That I from heaven will do it. That is power, my friend. That is power. And so, I've been conflicted on how to close this today. I really haven't known which way to go. Because I see two things that should be presented from this text today number one I should speak to you those of you who who you have a friend and that friend's in need I, I want to tell you what that friend needs more than anything in this world they don't need an inspirational quote you send them from Instagram or Facebook they don't need that 
they, and, you know, and oftentimes when we have friends in need, we think we have to say something. Like we feel like we just need to say something. Oftentimes we feel like we have to say something really spiritually smart. But I, I think I found from, from some elders and those that went on before me and I found from God's word that sometimes the best thing we can do is not say anything at all when our friends are in need. But what your friend needs more than anything is, is they need... They need you to have radical faith for them. Because they're going through a time and they're going through a hardship like maybe you've never experienced or maybe you have and that's why you need to be praying for them. And so I would say this morning that if you'd have radical faith on behalf of a friend, I'd get up and leave that pew and come to this altar and say, God, you know my friend and where they're at. And so, God, with my prayers, and, and, and through you, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and my praying on their behalf, that's, that's four crazy friends right there. Because God the Father wants to help them. God the Son's made a way for them to get help. And God the Spirit will be the agent to bring that help. And you're going to be the one who has radical faith on their behalf. So I would want to say this morning, if you're here and you've got a friend that's in desperate need, and you call that friend's name out, leave their name on this altar, and by doing so, you're saying, Lord, I've got radical faith today, believing that, Father, you can give them not only what they need, but what's best for them during this time. And then I would want to say to that individual who, well, you've knocked on the door of disappointment. You've been told no. What has been handed you is what you'd like to hand back if you could. But you can't do it. Because that's what you've woke up with today. And then I would ask you to get up and come to this altar and just say, I'm coming because my faith is weak. I'm hurting. I've been told no. But it sure be good if somebody beside me would pray for me this morning. If somebody to my right or my left or in front of me would lift me up, have some faith on my behalf because I need the prayers of some friends right now. I'm going through a troubling time. I'm going through a hard time. And if the Lord doesn't touch me, there'll be no help for me. I need the help of the Lord. And so if you come and you bring a friend to this altar, you bring a friend's name to this altar, and go ahead and open your eyes while you pray and because there ain't no sin against that. And look over here and see who's on your left or on your right. You don't have to know their name. and You don't have to know their need. Just look to your left and to your right. And say, Lord, there's a brother right here on my right side. I don't know why he's come, but I know he's got needs in his life. And Lord, I'm asking you to touch him and his and all of his. And Father, give him what he needs and give him what's better for him than what he ever could have asked for himself. So give him what's best, Lord. And pray for that individual on the left. Lord, on my left, there's a sister. I don't know why she's here. Maybe she just brought a friend. And I pray for her and I pray for that friend. Because here's why this morning I believe this will be life-changing for someone here today. Because the Bible said the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And I believe the power of the Lord is present to heal today.